En nombre de la Academia Parlamentaria y de la Biblioteca del Congreso Nacional, quisiéramos en primer lugar agradecer a la Embajada de los Estados Unidos que ha hecho posible la visita del señor Matthew Compton, quien nos ofrecerá una charla acerca de, eh, lo, de una estrategia digital para fortalecer la participación ciudadana. Fundamentalmente se, re, se referirá a la experiencia del gobierno de los Estados Unidos con el programa We the People. Don Matthew Compton es eh, su director de contenidos online de la Oficina de Estrategia Digital de la Casa Blanca. Ingresó a trabajar en la Casa Blanca en octubre del año 2011 y actualmente se desempeña como su director de contenidos online. Antes de ocupar este cargo fue director de una nueva campaña de medios del Comité Nacional Demócrata. Anteriormente trabajó como director de comunicaciones de la campaña legislativa del Comité Demócrata y como editor del Progressive Policy Institute. Mr. Compton nació en Carolina del Norte y se graduó en la Universidad de ese estado, la Universidad de Chapel Hill. Sin más introducción, le ofrezco la palabra al señor Matthew Compton. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Matt Compton, and I am the deputy director of online content and the Office of Digital Strategy for President Obama at the White House. And today I want to talk to you about a program uh, that I helped to run called We the People. <clears throat> When the United States was still a very new country, in fact, the very first time that Our, our Congress met after we passed our Constitution. That first group of lawmakers set about making our Constitution a little better. And the very first change they made, the very first amendment in what's called our Bill of Rights, uh, guarantees uh, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, and the right for people to assemble in public. The thing that people oftentimes forget about when it comes to the First Amendment is the fact that it also guaranteed the right for the people of the United States to petition their government for a redress of grievances. So that's what petitions mean to the people of the United States. It, it's sort of baked into our political identity. It's part of, who we, it's part of how we define ourselves. And for as long as there's been a United States, people have used petitions as a way to, to gather public opinions and to ask the government to take a certain action. But there, always, there hasn't always been a great way to make that transaction for uh, citizens to share that information uh, with their government. My boss uh, tells a story when he uh, was uh, working uh, for a group of activists uh, during the previous administration. And they'd collected tens of thousands of signatures from Americans who were opposed to the war in Iraq. And then it came time to deliver those petitions to the White House. And they had trouble finding the right person to come out and accept the petitions. To, to, to take the stack of papers and walk back inside. And finally, they were, they were left with the, the situation uh, that you see right there. They, they had to slide the papers under the gate. That's how they delivered their petitions to the White House. And at that moment, he realized there had to be a better way. So he came to the White House and was hired to run the digital team and started looking at ways where uh, the public has been particularly successful uh, registering their opinions with the government. And one of the models that he looked to was the sort of e-petition platform uh, that the United Kingdom government had created. And he started to get buy-in for something similar in the United States. And it became such a, a, a popular idea in the White House that the president 
President Obama signed off on it. And he said, uh, the day that the, white, that the We the People launched, he said, we're launching a new online tool called We the People to allow, petition, to allow Americans to directly petition the White House. And we'll share that technology so any government in the world can enable its citizens to do the same. Uh, and that's why I'm here in Chile talking with you all today. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is the, the page on the White House website uh, where you can go and start your petition right now. It basically sets up a simple bargain, meaning that anyone can ask the United States government to take an action, and in return, the United States government, President Obama, reserves their right to reply in kind. Individuals see the petition that they want to support, uh, they sign it. They receive an email asking them to confirm that they signed the petition in question. They confirm their signature and then it's registered. And when they do, they share their email address with the White House so that when it comes time for us to reply, we're able to do so. We launched in the fall of 2011. And in the time since, we've seen some real credible success. Uh, the graph ahead of you is actually still a little bit old, uh, is already a little bit old rather, uh, but as of uh, the middle of July, we'd seen 9.6 million people add 15 million signatures to petitions. What we see is a, is a, are three themes that make this process so valuable. The first is about discovering public opinion. The second is about establishing a dialogue and some public engagement with the public. And the third is about allowing us to focus on specific issues and sort of keep that conversation ongoing and learn more about public opinion because of it. What you're seeing right ahead of you is the single most popular piece of information that we've ever published on the White House website. It's a response to a petition asking President Obama to, be to begin construction of a Death Star from the movie Star Wars. That was a joke. The, 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 the petition creators probably didn't actually intend for the United States to begin construction of an interstellar weapon to defend us against threats from space. But when thousands and thousands of people signed on to it because they thought the idea was clever, uh, we embraced it. And when we issued that response, what we saw was that more than 100,000 people uh, took the time to realize that construction of something like the Death Star would cost uh, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, 96,000 people took the time to learn more about the International Space Station. We told people about uh, innovation when it comes to robotics. We told people about uh, a, 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 a research project to replace uh, limbs and arms and legs that people have lost. And tens of thousands of people took the time to find out about those projects too. Uh, NASA maintains a project where uh, you can receive a, a message on your phone when the International Space Station is overhead. So that you can take your child out to the backyard, point a telescope in the sky, and see this really remarkable human endeavor for yourself. And because of our petition response, uh, something like 20,000 people signed up to receive that message uh, and, and sort of indicated their own uh, enchantment with the idea of innovation and with space. And the really fascinating thing is, when we issued this response and we told people that we weren't going to do the thing that we asked them to do, we also sent them a survey. And even though I think maybe some people were disappointed, 66% of those who received our response said that it was helpful uh, to hear what we had to say. Just about half told us that they actually learned something completely new from the process. And uh, between 80 and 90% told us that they enjoyed the, the back and forth so much that they'd start a new petition. They'd use We the People again. 
And to us, there's no better indicator of success than a, a repeat customer, someone who valued the experience enough to say that they'd do it again. In December of uh, last year, a tragedy happened. A gunman walked into an elementary school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and murdered students and teachers. And it, it was a moment where the entire country was focused on one issue, uh, an issue that has a lot of different facets to it, but ultimately is, is how we can meet, keep community safe, how we keep our children safe. And moments after the sort of event hit the news, people started coming to We the People to register their opinions either way. And in the first couple hours after the event, uh, a petition created by a guy named David, who lives not far from Washington, D.C., uh, collected thousands of signatures and then tens of thousands of signatures. And, and he wanted uh, the president to take action. He wanted to, the president to find ways uh, to reduce gun violence in the United States. And his idea, his simple request, it, it caught the public imagination. When the president and the vice president uh, stood in front of the White House and, and described the things that we were going to do to begin taking action to reduce gun violence, to improve mental health care, to make schools safer, uh, we invited David to the White House. And this is what he told us. He said, I just wrote what was on my mind, posted it directly to my account on Tumblr. And within hours, it had thousands of signatures. At the time, 25,000 signatures were what it took to uh, receive a response from the president's office. Uh, and the petition received that by the end of the first day. And at that point, it jumped off of Twitter and onto Tumblr and to Facebook and, and sort of into the public awareness. And David wasn't alone. We saw, I think, 33 people create petitions uh, in the first uh, day or so after uh, the shooting in Sandy Hook. And we saw hundreds of thousands of people look to those petitions as a way to register their opinion, as a way to uh, give voice to what they were thinking. And some of them uh, were against additional gun control measures. Some of them were for it. Uh, but it was such a moment of clarity for us at the White House that we realized the only person who could actually respond to these petitions was the president. And that was the first time that he took the chance to, to respond to one of these petitions himself. Uh, he sat down in front of a camera and he laid out what he thought. He talked about uh, you know, how the, the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution does guarantee an individual's right to, to have a weapon, uh, but how there are common sense limits uh, to you know, that right, how uh, there are steps we could take right away, common sense steps we could take uh, to make communities safer. And for us, the real sort of value there was, was it in creating a dialogue. At the bottom of that petition response, we didn't just survey individuals, we asked them to share their ideas with us uh, to help make uh, their community safer. And as this debate continued to unfold, we the people continued to be a way that more and more people weighed in on the debate. Pierce Morgan is a journalist for CNN, and he used his program to call for uh, new gun control legislation, and his sort of repeated calls were so annoying, so abhorrent to some conservatives that uh, a gentleman named Alex Jones, who is a, a radio talk show host, uh, decided to start a petition on We the People calling for the government of the United States to deport Pierce Morgan, to send him back to the United Kingdom. And uh, 109,334 people ended up signing that petition. Now, if you're the President of the United States, if you're Barack Obama, it's very easy to talk to people who agree with you. It's very easy to, to get your message out to those who support your position, who uh, believe in your viewpoint. Those are the individuals who follow you on Twitter. Those are the, pe the people who sign up to receive emails from the White House and from the President. Those are the people who take the time 
to sit down and, and watch the news and, and hear what the president has to say. But right now in American society, if you want to talk to your critics, if you're a public official and you want to talk to those with whom you disagree, it's, it's actually a much more difficult thing to do because they don't sign up to your Twitter account to get news from you. They don't uh, want to receive uh, emails directly from you as a rule. And they get most of their news from uh, you know, institutions with a point of view that, that isn't supportive of the president either. And so what we saw in this moment and what we saw with this petition asking the president to deport Pierce Morgan was an opportunity to talk to a group of people that we would never otherwise get to talk to, people who were uh, very much uh, not in agreement with the president's position. And that was incredibly valuable. The uh, press secretary of the United States, Jay Carney, was the one who, who took the time to write that petition and, and, and to sign it. And his response was that uh, while we respect the Second Amendment, uh, which guarantees a right to uh, bear arms in the United States, we also respect the first, which guarantees the freedom of the press and which guarantees the freedom of speech and that we wouldn't be deporting anyone. And it, it wasn't a, a response that we expected to be particularly well received, but we surveyed people afterwards. And even these people who were very critical of the president and who didn't agree with what he had to say at all, 25% of them told us that they learned something new from our response. Almost half uh, told us that they thought our response was actually helpful. And of them, nine out of 10 said that they thought that we the people experience was so valuable that they were gonna do it again. This dialogue is something that we've found to be useful over and over and over again. Uh, when the, the system first launched, uh, we received a number of petitions asking us to, to begin to reform the immigration system in the United States. And the sort of the group of policy experts uh, who deal with that issue uh, thought that the, the sort of conversation was so helpful that they didn't want it to end when they uh, issued that first that issued that first reply. So we invited a group of, of petition signers uh, to to join a call with these with these experts and hear you know, the work that the president was doing to reform the immigration system and to hear their ideas for ways that the system could be improved. And now that legislation has passed the Senate of the United States and is working its way through the House, we've gone back to these people again and again and again and continued the conversation, kept moving it forward. That's something that would never have been possible before this system. It's something that would have been uh, incredibly hard to do in sort of any other era in American political history, uh, but now it's part of our tool set. Now it's part of the way that we talk to people. One of the, uh, another of the, the very early petitions that we received with the system asked us to do more uh, to protect puppies. Uh, in the United States, there's a system by which uh, a lot of puppies come from uh, people who, who, who breed the animals, uh, who, who breed the dogs, uh, and sell them for a profit. And, uh, and some, sometimes these conditions can be absolutely terrible. You know, uh, the mothers of the dogs are, are kept in cages their entire lives where they're not allowed to move around. Uh, and for, for those who feel very strongly about animal rights, uh, it's, it's completely abhorrent. And the Department of Agriculture in the United States has authority to do something to regulate that industry. And there was an open question as to whether or not they were going to do so. So a group of these activists started a petition on We the People. And in our reply, we were able to tell them that, that we thought that there was room to do more to regulate the commercial breeders. And we, we sort of use that as an opportunity to inform them about the, the, the process by which the, the Department of Agriculture was soliciting feedback as they thought about rule changes. And then, uh, a few months later, when, when the Department of Agriculture actually did put new rules in place, we went back to these people again and made sure that they were aware uh, uh, of a new rule that was actually in place uh, from the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service 
uh, that, that essentially did many of the things that they asked to do too originally. Um, so it was a real opportunity for us to educate a group of people who felt very passionate about an issue that wasn't necessarily part of our day-to-day our -day communication strategy. But it's not just a tool uh, for education. It's not just a tool for dialogue. It, it's also a tool that helps us focus on issues that are uh, new uh, to the White House or uh, that we've never been asked to uh, deal with before. In the United States, if an individual buys a cell phone, uh, they, they go to a cell phone company like AT&T or Verizon, and they sign a contract. And for two years, they, they are beholden to that contract, and that's how they get their new phone. At the end of the two years, they're, they can always leave the service provider, uh, and, and they can take their, their cell phone number with them. But there was an open question about what happens uh, to the phone that they actually uh, had, had, had paid for for the past two years about whether or not they could take that with them to a new service provider. For years and years and years, the rule hadn't been well defined uh, and, and that created some, some gray area that allowed consumers to basically do what they wanted. But this past spring, uh, a sort of agency of the federal government uh, changed the rule or defined the rule and they said that wasn't a right that consumers had. And it, it was a real moment of, uh, of clarity for the public. And uh, in about three weeks, 120 plus thousand people had signed a petition asking us to guarantee that individual people, that individual consumers, have the right to unlock their cell phones and take them with them once they're up, once their contracts are up. This had never been a question that the President of the United States had to deal with before. This wasn't a, a, a place where the president, where President Obama, had a position. But what, but what the petition allowed us to do was to convene a conversation. And the picture that you see here is the actual meeting where individuals from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the National Economic Council, and policy experts from across the, the federal, the executive branch of the federal government, sat down in a room and didn't leave until they figured out what the president's position would be. And ultimately, they came down on the side of consumers. In our response, we said, it's, it's time to legalize cell phone unlocking, but consumers should have this right. And after that public outcry, after our response, lawmakers on Capitol Hill paid attention. A group of senators and a group of, Dem uh, a group of uh, members of the House of Representatives, both Republicans and Democrats, all introduced legislation uh, that would legalize this right, that would sort of add this uh, consumer freedom uh, to our legal code. And now though that, that those laws are working their way through the legislative process, and it's all because a group of people started a petition on the White House website. We've been really happy with uh, the sort of first version of this platform, uh, but we don't want to stop. We don't want to uh, be complacent in our success. And so we've begun to lay out uh, a roadmap for continued development. Uh, back in June, we released uh, uh, the very first version of an API, uh, an application programming interface that allows individuals to pull data out from the system. And going forward, we're actually working uh, on a system uh, that will allow individuals to host petitions on their own websites and send that data to uh, we the people, to whitehouse.gov. What does that look like? Well, for starters, uh, we have uh, presences on two big portals for development online if you're a web developer or an engineer. The first is Drupal.org, the second is GitHub. And anyone in the world right now can go to GitHub and they can get they can see our roadmap. They can see the code that we've already developed and they can see the place where we're going uh, with the platform. Uh, what we think is that by developing this API, we'll go from a place where we have 9.6 million users to a place where where we could have 90 million users, where, where we could, you know, go to, to uh, so we begin and sort of 
exponential growth yet again. Because right now, everyone who wants to use We The People has to come to whitehouse.gov. That's where they create their petition. That's where they sign their petition. That's where they read their response. But there are people all over the world who are, are, are creating petitions every day to ask the President of the United States to do something. And we want those people to have the opportunity to, to plug into the official system, to continue to host the petition on their own site, uh, but to enter into that bargain that I was describing with you at the beginning, where they ask something of us and they get a response from us in turn. Now, the first part of this, the, the, the read API, where people can pull data out from We The People has already been tremendously successful. Um, we hosted uh, two uh, events called hackathons at the White House, where we've invited volunteers, uh, volunteer web engineers, volunteer web developers, to come to the White House and to use our tool, or to use uh, We The People to build their own tools to help analyze the data. We've seen dozens of projects created, everything from maps that show where the postal codes from any particular petition uh, are being registered. So we're able to look and see where petitions are popular all across the country. Uh, we've seen heat maps uh, to show where they're popular all across the world. We've seen people build predictive models that look at the rate that a petition is growing and uh, make an assessment about whether or not it will cross the threshold. Uh, we've seen better search tools to allow people to search the entire body of petitions that have ever been created. We've seen uh, tools that pull all of the, the, the terms from every petition that's ever been created and, and map them out uh, in a word cloud so that you can see popular trends uh, from across the entire system. And our hope is that going forward, we're able to sort of build some of those into the system, bake them directly into We The People itself, uh, so that individuals who don't have the sort of uh, technical skills required to build their own tools are still able to get that sort of higher level analysis. Um, and that, that helps to contribute to these three themes as well. That's where I'm going to end for today. Um, I'm looking forward to having uh, some, to answering some of your questions now, uh, but I hope that if you have other questions after today, uh, you'll also be in touch. Um, please send me an email. It's uh, mcompton at who.eop.gov. Um, and with that, uh, let's turn it over and, and sort of begin a question and answer. Thank you, Mr. Campos. Uh, voy a dejar con la palabra a continuación a don Álvaro Medina, quien es licenciado en comunicaciones, ex director del Diario de la Nación, actualmente jefe de comunicaciones de la Biblioteca del Congreso Nacional. Posteriormente ofreceremos la palabra a todos ustedes para que puedan formular las consultas que les parezca. Dejo la palabra a don Álvaro. Muchas gracias. Quiero agradecer en esta ocasión, antes de decir cualquier cosa, la posibilidad de haber tenido esta charla de Matt Compton, aquí en la Biblioteca del Congreso Nacional, agradecerle a la Academia Parlamentaria y agradecer también al director de la Biblioteca del Congreso, don Alfonso Pérez, que llegó unos minutos atrasado, pero después se va a incorporar con algunas palabras probablemente. Eh, agradecer también porque lo que nos acaba de decir Matt Compton es un concepto que dice relación con la posibilidad de ocupar la comunicación, que es el negocio donde aquellos que trabajamos en eso estamos. Ocupar la comunicación ya no como una forma solo de generar relación entre distintas instituciones y sus públicos. En este caso, entre gobiernos y sus ciudadanos. Es más que eso. En este caso, se está usando con esta estrategia digital llamada We the People, la comunicación como una posibilidad de mejorar el sistema democrático. Es mucho más que poner la, disposición a la tecnología a disposición de la democracia. Es mejorar el sistema democrático es digitalizar las relaciones que eh, permiten eh, desarrollar una mayor democracia. Hay que decir que en Chile estamos aún en, en, 
pañales respecto de estrategias que se atrevan a tanto como eso, no obstante que hay algunos ejemplos muy valiosos. En, eh, en la Biblioteca del Congreso estamos nosotros desarrollando, también lo han hecho en las distintas cámaras, distintas formas de poder eh, acercar sobre todo las leyes a los ciudadanos. Podemos mencionar aquí que hay programas como Ley Fácil, que existen a partir de la Biblioteca del Congreso y donde también trabajamos en conjunto con la Cámara de Diputados donde se, tra se trata de traducir ese lenguaje eh, legal tan difícil a veces para los ciudadanos en algo que sea comprensible por todos eh, de manera que los ciudadanos puedan entender cuáles son los beneficios y cuáles son los elementos que eh, los obligan en términos de, 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 del producto legal. No obstante y aquí es donde me quiero referir brevemente, en términos comunicativos esto va mucho más allá, eh, va mucho más allá de integrar la información en la tecnología, porque las estrategias digitales, tal como las está planteando el señor Compton, están rompiendo con los procesos comunicativos tradicionales que se ocupan en un sistema democrático. Eh, primero por la velocidad de interacción, eh, que se multiplica de manera exponencial, donde el modelo tradicional de emisorio receptor eh, se desdibuja y por lo tanto se hace imposible o se hace muy difícil y por eso hay un desafío grande ahí en, eh, en la posibilidad de manejar las reacciones que se producen a través de las redes sociales eh, y aun cuando uno pueda insertarse en las redes sociales para generar políticas públicas porque sobre todo cuando no está bien manejado de pronto vemos que eh, lo digital permite que los individuos con una rapidez y una facilidad impresionante se transformen en masa. Hay autores que, que nos pueden ilustrar muchísimo más respecto de esta reacción que se produce a veces eh, en términos del individuo transformado en masa y particularmente en materia del de, de mundo digital y el mundo de las redes sociales. Y el tercer gran desafío que a mí me parece que es importante en términos de estrategias digitales es cómo uno hace para enfrentarse a una multiplicación de los receptores en el modelo comunicacional. Yo ya no le estoy hablando a eh, un conjunto de receptores anónimos, sino que le estoy hablando a un conjunto de ciudadanos, ahora con nombre y apellido, que interactúan conmigo, que me cuestionan, que me hacen preguntas, que me exigen. Y eso es un desafío político de marca mayor. De manera tal que en los procesos comunicacionales que estaban acostumbrados a generar relaciones, en este minuto se enfrentan al desafío de relaciones a través de las redes sociales hacen mucho más difíciles. Los procesos comunicativos son nuevos. Eh, los conjuntos de ciudadanos, o como le llaman más el, a nivel de marketing, los mercados son más difuminados están eh, micro segmentados. Hay en ese conjunto liderazgos múltiples y además son liderazgos efímeros, como esas máquinas de juego de, de esos niños en que aparecen cuando los llevan los niños a jugar a, y hay unas máquinas donde aparecen unos monos que hay que pegarles, ¿no? Y aparecen cabezas y desaparecen. Lo mismo esto en las redes sociales, las... Eh, los liderazgos son así de, de efímeros. Por lo tanto, es muy difícil, hay una dificultad enorme en términos de decir lo que dicen, lo que dicen las redes sociales y convertirlo en políticas públicas. Lo que acabamos de escuchar con esta estrategia We the People es un desafío que en el fondo se nos está presentando como un tremendo ejemplo. Recogen lo que dice la gente, y uno puede subrayar gente, y convierten las redes sociales en una nueva ágora ateniense. Aquí es donde pueden entonces debatir, deliberar. Y por lo tanto, es un mundo donde las demandas del individuo, aun cuando no esté eh, apoyado por estructuras tradicionales, las demandas del individuo bien planteadas, tienen una posibilidad legislativa y por lo tanto tienen una posibilidad de convertirse en una demanda ciudadana organizada y con posibilidades de cambiar una situación de necesidad pública. Noten cómo esto puede, y de hecho lo hace, desafía las estructuras tradicionales y cómo se construyen las políticas públicas. 
La pregunta, en todo caso, bueno, hay varias preguntas que se plantean en este, en este debate y en, eh, y, en, y en este tipo de estrategias digitales. ¿Qué pasa en ese ámbito con la noción de opinión pública? ¿Dónde está? Si ya no la encuentro necesariamente en la calle, ¿la encuentro realmente en eh, las redes sociales o la interacción a través de Internet? ¿Es, por lo tanto, la opinión pública igual a la participación en redes sociales o a la participación controlada a través de, de los canales de Internet? Y, por lo tanto, otra pregunta que se, eh, se trasunta después de ello es ¿qué tan representativa es una política pública basada en estrategias digitales? Es un debate que, sin duda, recién comienza. El, eh, esta estrategia We the People es, es un desafío a que conversemos sobre, sobre esto eh, y en todo caso hay que decir que si llegamos a concluir que hay una representación real a través de las redes sociales y podemos realmente hacer políticas públicas a través de las redes sociales y a través de las estrategias digitales estamos, a mi juicio, frente a un mundo completamente nuevo eh, donde hay un ciudadano distinto un ciudadano virtual un ciudadano, como podríamos decirlo, con un avatar y ese ciudadano que a pesar de tener una participación virtual, es un ciudadano que llega a tener un poder real. Y ese es eh, el verdadero cambio que podemos ver desde una estrategia de comunicaciones hacia un mejoramiento del sistema democrático. Ese es el comentario. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Quería saber eh, cuáles son los criterios con los que deciden en la Casa Blanca, ¿cuáles son las peticiones o qué nivel de apoyo deben tener esas peticiones para llegar a ser acogidas por el, por el sistema? That's a great question. When we began, we weren't sure how popular uh, We the People was going to be. So the day that we launched, we said that any petition that collects at least 5,000 signatures will get a response from the administration. we quickly realized that 5,000 signatures was not a very high threshold. And so uh, we raised the barrier to uh, raise that threshold to 25,000. And for the first essentially year of the, of the program's existence, that was great. We were able to see you know, lots of ideas that, that, that gained wide support across the system. And then the 2012 election happened in the United States in November. And people from across the country, from every ideology, from every ideology, from every political party, from every perspective, came to We the People and used used it as a way to register their opinions, as a way to express their excitement about the re-election of the president, or as a way to express their disapproval. And that's the day that we went from sort of steady growth to vertical growth. And we quickly realized at that point that petitions were uh, crossing the threshold uh, you know, of 25,000 signatures in the first 10 days or 12 days of their existence and only slowing down because they'd actually crossed that threshold. And our audience had grown wide enough that we raised the barrier to 100,000. And that's where it is now. Any petition uh, that collects 100,000 signatures is guaranteed to get a response from the White House. Now, those aren't the only petitions that we respond to. The president looks at we the people as an opportunity to talk, to communicate his viewpoints to a range of individuals. And so there, there are plenty of times in which we've responded to petitions that didn't actually collect that 100,000 signatures. But that 100,000 mark right now is for us a very good number because it, it, it does begin to answer that sort of question um, that we just heard about uh, whether or not opinions collected online are representative. Now, we've had close to 10 million people use We the People at this point, and, but there are you know, almost 300 million people in the United States. So this isn't, this isn't a tool that's being used by everyone yet. But when you start talking about these larger numbers, you start to get, uh, you start to scale to the point where you can, you can feel confident that even if it's not a majority opinion, that it's one held by a wide swath of American society and thus certainly worth our time. 
as the system continues to grow, we'll, we'll make further evaluations, we'll, we'll, we'll reconsider. Um, and as the team that I work on gets bigger, we'll find we'll, we'll look for more opportunities to respond to petitions that don't manage to quite collect that 100,000 mark or whatever the threshold is. Uh, but for us right now, that's a reasonable number. Uh, so my name is Grace. I'm doing an internship in the Department of Public Finance, Chilean Department of Ministerio de Hacienda. Um, and we're currently working on a website that is somewhat similar to With the People in the way that we want people to learn about the bills that the department is sponsoring and that are moving their way through Congress or about legislation that has already been, been passed. And so we want people to vote on these bills, to communicate, to comment on our website. Uh, and it hasn't been launched yet. So well, my main question is, how did you get that original traction to get people to hear, to know about We The People, to start using it? Um, that's my first question. And then the second one is um, about the users. Do you have like a sort of registration system or is it just anybody can post on it? And if you do have a registration system, how do you how do you make sure that the same person is not creating like different accounts or uh, what kind of information do you ask from people to make sure that those signatures uh, are legitimate or valid? Great. So we'll take those one at a time. Uh, the great thing about a platform like We the People, where where individuals are creating their own petitions and then asking their friends, their neighbors, their family to support that position is that you're empowering people to, to do the advertising for you. So uh, they sort of become uh, evangelists for the system. They are the ones sharing it uh, with their communities. And once I'm asked to sign a petition, Oftentimes, I begin to look at other petitions and begin to think about it as a tool that I might use myself one day when I want to express my own opinion. Um, so I, I think that in some ways, uh, we, we sort of create our own uh, success with a platform like We the People, with a platform uh, built around petitions, because uh, we're asking people to uh, sort of help to sell the service or to help to advertise the service on their own. But the other side of that, the other piece to that, is that people have to get value from the system in order for it to make sense for them to continue to use it. Uh, if, if, if our responses don't actually address the premise of their question, if they're not authentic, if they don't treat people with the respect that they deserve for spending their time entering into a public discourse, then I think we wouldn't see the success that we've seen. Uh, because people would be turned off by the whole process. They wouldn't believe in it. Uh, if we weren't transparent about the rules that we were setting and, and, and weren't clear about what the thresholds were, if when we need to moderate petitions, we weren't clear in laying out the expectations about why a petition stays up versus why one comes down, then I, I think that people would lose trust in the system. So you, you have to get those pieces right as well if you really want people to uh, become advocates for the system if you want people to buy into it. The other thing that, that uh, I, I think is really important for that it has to do with your second question, which is that we do ask our users uh, to verify uh, their accounts. Um, we do it all through email. So when I sign a petition, I receive a message in my inbox asking me to verify that, that, that I did sign that petition. And, once, and it's not until I actually click on that link in my email that my signature counts. And what we found is that that's a pretty good way to ensure that people are only signing the petition once, uh, that they're you know, taking time to seriously uh, use the platform. But we don't ask people to verify that they're American citizens. We don't ask people to verify that they live in the United States. Uh, we don't ask people to sort of share any sort of personally identifying information that they don't want to share. They can give us their names. They're invited to give us their postal codes because that helps us better understand the system, but they don't have to. The only thing they have to share is that email address. And 
uh, we've made a conscious choice not to limit it to people in the United States, in part because there are quite a few Americans who live abroad, but in part because we don't, we want the people of the world who, who, who have things that they want the United States government to do, to also be able to use the system. And that's absolutely been the case. Uh, some of our most popular petitions have been created uh, in Malaysia, in Russia. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, a group of students in China discovered We the People. And for weeks, we were inundated uh, with uh, petitions from China written in, in Chinese uh, as the system gained wider notice in that country. And it, it required some extra time from my team. Uh, we had to spend more time translating uh, what those petitions were asking us and verifying that they were actually asking for something that the federal government was empowered to do. Uh, but we, we also saw real value in that too, um, because it, we sort of see a responsibility uh, to communicate uh, the president's position uh, clearly to everyone who, who's curious to learn more. Good afternoon, Mr. Copton. Why did Huawei House decide to to choose this um, online tool. And what is your opinion about the social media in these uh, matters? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We chose, we chose to use this tool. We chose to build We The People because we saw a need for it. Uh, as I said a little earlier before in the petition, uh, in my presentation, the people of the United States have always used petitions as a tool for communicating with their government. But prior to the sort of current day and age, there wasn't a great way to sort of verify their relationship. You know, if you're given a stack of, of, of papers with, you know, handwritten signatures on it, that, that, there's use in that. There's value in that and, and, and sort of seeing that people took the time to sign something. But there's no way to verify that the same person didn't sign the petition 500 times. Uh, there's no way to sort of uh, open that opportunity up to everyone and give empower everyone to sort of register their opinion. And, and that's what an online tool like We the People allows you to do. It allows you to scale. It allows you to, you know, collect hundreds of thousands of signatures over the course of a few weeks or a few days. Um, it, it allows you to build a service that, that's been used by millions and millions of people. And that sort of wider scale, that, that sort of greater demographic diversity, um, it, it helps us to build trust in the system. Uh, it helps to, to capture the attention of people in the White House. When you go to a policy expert and you tell them that 100,000 people express an opinion about an issue on which they were working, they sit back and take notice. Uh, they realize that there's value in taking the time to respond. They realize that there's, it's worth their time to uh, be, just to really dig in and to give her a, a, a forthright and substantive response. Um, so uh, that's uh, the reason that we sort of built uh, this tool online. Uh, but I think that the, the, the value of social media overall, when it comes to public service, when it comes to governance, is that it, it allows, uh, public officials, it allows leaders, it allows the government to talk to people where they are. In our current American society, we're seeing some, some fragmentation when it comes to the public discourse. You know, my parents tuned into the evening news every night when they were children. They watched the same network or two. Everybody heard the same message at the same time. But now there's a range of additional options. And people can really choose how they get the news. People can really choose uh, what they choose to learn about the world. And if you aren't giving them the option of hearing from you, then you can't expect them to be educated about your position. So we launch a presence on a service like Tumblr, which is very new because it's incredibly popular with young people in the United States who are, are of a generation that doesn't even embrace Facebook, much less sit down and read the New York Times or, or watch you know, uh, the news on one of the, the big national networks. So that's, that's the value to us in, in, in embracing these sort of social platforms.
con Juan Beglia, director de comunicaciones de la Cámara de Comercio. Matt, eh, yo quisiera consultarte, Matt, específicamente por la por eh, la cantidad de otros medios de comunicación con que cuenta el gobierno de Estados Unidos, que existían antes de, de que ustedes pusieran en pie el, el We the People. ¿Qué ha, ¿Qué ha ocurrido con los medios, con la página web de la Casa Blanca, con la, los sistemas que tienen de radio y televisión, los diversos programas eh, y, en el plano interno como exterior, con la información que obtienen eh, como feedback de los ciudadanos, que si de alguna manera esto llega, por decirlo así, a definir la agenda o la pauta de estos medios institucionales. En some ways, social media allows us to amplify the agenda that we've already set for ourselves. It allows us the, to, to broadcast uh, the president's message, the president's beliefs, to a wider audience. It allows us to, to inform uh, more citizens. But there are moments when it helps us to choose a new area for focus, when it helps us to uh, realize that we have to make a decision. Uh, I talked about one of them with the cell phone unlocking. Uh, you know, in a previous administration, that, that might have been sort of impossible uh, just to ever bubble up to the attention of senior staff at the White House. But with We the People, it's easy. Um, every afternoon and every morning, uh, my the, the, the Office of Digital Strategy assembles a, a list of topics that are trending online, a list of search terms that, that are the most popular search terms on Google. And we send that to senior staff across the White House because they want to know what people are searching for. They want to know what people are talking about online uh, because that's going to help them inform their choices. Uh, about what to focus on for the day to day, what to focus on uh, for the next week. Um, so it, it's, 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 it gives us uh, a better temperature for public opinion. It gives us uh, more data to, to better uh, inform our choices. Yeah, just one last thing. Uh -huh. um, so when people go to We the People, and they post something, is that immediately up on the page available to everybody? Or does it go through somebody on your team to make sure that you know it's nothing inappropriate or that, or maybe even review the criteria, whether it is something that is um, something that the office or the president is able to do and not another agency or something else? Uh, that's a very important question. Um, once an individual creates a petition, it is available right away, but it doesn't, it, it only, they, only they have the link. Only they have the ability uh, to send it around and begin to collect signatures. It doesn't show up when you search for it. Uh, it isn't, uh, doesn't appear on a list of every petition active on the site. You have to collect a certain number of signatures before it, it reaches that first threshold where it's, it's publicly available. Uh, once a petition collects 10 signatures, someone on my team reviews it. There are three of us who do that every day. Uh, and because I'm here, there are two people who do that every day. Uh, and what we do is, is we, we look for three things. First and the most important is that we, we, we make sure that the petition asks us to do something that's within the scope of the federal government. Uh, the, the example that, that I, I like to give most frequently, the thing that most often requires us to take a petition down uh, for being out of scope is when they demand that a... Uh, a sports star, an athlete, go play for a different team. President Obama can't make a magic wand, can't wave a magic wand and uh, require LeBron James to go back to Cleveland. Uh, LeBron James can't, I mean, uh, the President Obama can't uh, demand that uh, Jay-Z record a new album, right? Uh, there's sort of, there has to be a legal framework by which the federal government could possibly take action. And if there's not, we take down the petition and we send a note to the petition creator explaining that they asked him to do something that was outside the scope of the federal government. The petition also actually has to ask us for something. It can't just be a statement of opinion. There has to be a request. That doesn't happen very often. We've sort of made it, we try to make it very clear when you create a petition that there has to be a request built in. Uh, but every now and again, we do have to take the petition down because they, they, they stop short of asking for us to do something. 
we don't allow profanity. Uh, we don't allow lewd uh, comments or inappropriate language. Uh, we also take steps to make sure that no one's personal uh, information is being uh, shared. Uh, you can't post someone's telephone number. You can't post someone's email address. You, you, you can't post their social security number. You can't do something that, that might violate an, an individual's privacy. But really, those are the only things that uh, most frequently require us to take a petition down. We'll also, we also make sure that the system's not being gamed. Uh, every now and again, I think maybe only twice, uh, we've had to remove a petition because we saw a number of the, the signatures were fraudulent. Uh, but because we verify every signature, that happens very rarely. Um, and then once the petition actually collects enough signatures, it's publicly available on the site, it shows up when you search on Google, uh, and that's when the petition really takes off, but only after it's been uh, reviewed by our team. Every now and again, something gets popular so quickly, uh, you know, at 12 o'clock at night, uh, a petition goes live and all of us are asleep. And by the morning, it's already collected enough signatures to be public and we have to make a very quick decision. Uh, but for the most part, that system works really well. Me falta una muy importante. ¿Cuánta gente trabaja contigo, Matt, en el equipo de, de We The People? Um, as I mentioned, there are three of us involved in the day-to-day. -day. And when I tell people that, there seems to be a, a refusal to believe it. Uh, but it's true. Uh, there's only There are three of us who administer it. There are three of us who work to, to make sure that uh, the petitions across the threshold get responses, and those responses get reviewed by the appropriate people across the White House. But we do have a lot of support. Uh, there, there are a, a team of, of engineers and web developers for the White House uh, who maintain all of the, the sites on whitehouse.gov, uh, who, who maintain all the sort of web needs uh, of the White House. And uh, they've got some, they have a very big job to make sure that the site stays up to make sure that uh, people actually do get that email asking them to verify their signature. And they're also the ones who build the improvements that we're baking into the system now. Um, but on any given day, we get one of their time or two of their two people's time. Uh, so it's not a massive team of people supporting us from a technical standpoint either. Uh, the other people who are really important to the process are two attorneys in the, uh, the White House, an office of White House counsel, who make sure that we're not violating any laws, and we really value that. Uh, and they also are the ones who help us to make sure that the petitions are in scope, which we were just talking about, uh, because uh, we can't always make a judgment ourselves about whether they're asking for something that we're constitutionally allowed to do. Uh, and finally, we, we work very closely with a couple people from the uh, Office of, of Communications, uh, to help make sure that we're adequately, we're accurately communicating the president's position. And obviously when it comes time to respond, there are a range of policy experts who help us uh, figure out what the substance of the response should be. And in many cases, they're the ones who are actually taking the time to draft that response and signing it. Um, but day to day, just true. Bien. Muchas gracias, Nercom.